Hello to everybody. Uh, I'm Filipos Mazarakis. Um, my role here is as a speaker. I'm also representing the National History Museum, uh, which is uh, um, supporting uh, this conference, as you may have noticed. So I wish to welcome you also, uh, all the public. And uh, I really hope, despite the fact uh, we are locked away at home, that we can have a fruitful discussion that, uh, in the same way as it would have been if we were uh, holding this session in the old parliament building, the seat of the National History Museum, where originally it was supposed to take place. The National Historical Museum is one of the oldest and biggest ones in Greece. It is also one of the most official ones. Until recently, it was perceived by the public as a portrayal of the official viewing of history, so much so as in school textbooks. It was some years ago included by the European project UNAMUS as the Greek study case on national museums, and the findings on visitor expectancies were striking. Our permanent display still goes along these lines. We present the modern history of the nation, the factors which led to the Greek War of Independence of 1821, and the building of a European nation-state in the 19th and early 20th century. I won't say more, but in order to understand the project I will present you next, you need to understand that this is a traditional national museum among those founded in the 19th century to promote national cohesion, and it takes its role as such very seriously. The exhibition Imagining the Balkans, Identities and Memory in the Long 19th Century has taken an educational role even though we would more easily place it in the discussion panel related to difficult heritage. This was a project coordinated and funded by UNESCO with the support of ICOM. The aim was to facilitate dialogue among museums in Southeast Europe. There were 12 regional history museums involved from every state in the region recognized by the UN. The idea was to show things that unite us and contribute to an effort to surpass the ideological deadlocks in the region. The 12 participant museums decided that the only relevant issue was to talk about the formation of national identities and national states, mostly in the 19th century. This is at the root of our national disputes. It is a politically motivated project with a specific aim for educating the general public. The exhibition took a thematic approach at the national formation phenomena. We showed that all national states went through the same processes of ideology related to economic and social transformation even if some started as early as the 18th century and others well into the 20th. We also showed that what happened in the Balkans is what happened in the rest of Europe too, only later and faster. The stereotype of a Balkan curse, of a barbari Balkan barbaric trend, all this is pure extrapolation. We talked about the formation of middle classes related to the commercial development and the opening of roads and railways. We talked about the standardization of languages and the creation of schools. We talked of maps designed to provide a real or coveted space for the nation. We talked of manipulating history through the creation of heroes and seminal events. We talked about traditional folklore transformed into a statement of national belonging. We talked about ceremonies and monuments, seeking to fix collective memory along official lines. We even talked about music. We presenting this song that is well known to all the region, but whose provenance is fairly disputed by each nation as its own. <laughs>
Wherever it, it was presented, the exhibition created some interest, but was also challenged. The official opening took place at the National History Museum of Slovenia as part of the program of the min meeting of ministers of culture in the region. Were also present the Secretary General of UNESCO, the EU Commissioner for Culture and the President of ICOM. The Sabanji Museum, our partner from Turkey, had removed itself before that, ironically accusing the project of promoting nationalism. Turkey often sees itself on the opposite shore of the ideological debate as a representative of the successor state to the Ottoman Empire, traditional enemy of all the other regional nationalisms. The Turkish Museum was deeply offended by the fact that in the national ideologies presented, the Ottoman is often seen as the oppressor and arch enemy. The problem of historical interpretation when identity issues are tackled resides in the fact that presenting negative aspects is often assimilated to endorsing them. Also, we suffered from the amalgamation of the terms Ottoman and Turk. So when we talk of the failings of the Ottoman Empire, many believe it to be a criticism directed against Turkey. Then, we had a dispute between Bulgaria and North Macedonia, which at that point was still referred to as FIROM, former Yugoslav Republic of Macedonia, over the ownership of a hero and of a flag on display. The dispute provoked such scandal that it had to be resolved by the general director of UNESCO herself, in cooperation with the ambassadors of the two countries, while we, the curators, were left waiting for an answer to be dictated to us. This is one of the texts in question. Last, when the exhibition came to Athens in December 2014, it was viciously attacked by a part of the press with nationalist and populist tendencies. I was personally accused of legalizing the use of the term Macedonia by our neighboring nation, by accepting the museum's name Museum of Macedonia. In reality, we were following closely the terminology rules of the United Nations. There was no mention of a Macedonian nation or state. On the other hand, these, these same rules precluded any intervention on the names of institutions. Having been invited by UNESCO as equal partners with the others, we were in no position to impose any such intervention. On the other hand, building a working relationship with our sister museum seemed in the long term to offer important advantages. Cooperating does not mean automatically condoning either the use of the name nor the views presented by this museum in its own exhibitions. I wished to present these cases of dispute in order to show how difficult a project this was. Still, for our museum, this was a game changer. Since then, our image as a provider of new, alternative, complementary readings of history has grown exponentially. Although a museum can never by itself be such an important player that it changes a whole national perception, I am proud to say that we did manage to offer an approach new to many and to create discussion. Next, I would like to say a, a few words about another project we realized two years ago, A Touch of History. It aims at making the museum accessible to blind and partially seeing visitors. Apart from providing signalization for tactile exhibits and a leaflet in braille and in large print, we designed a comprehensive touch tour which works this way. The visitor is taken around in a guided tour, followed by a trolley with drawers. Within the drawers are kept a selection of objects, originals and copies according to each object's conservation requirements. The tour gives an overview of the history presented in the museum, focusing on themes and subjects that may, mat that may matter most to people with visual impairments. Whenever there is no tactile exhibit within the permanent display, 
the lack is complemented by one of the exhibits in the drawers. This way, we are able to give access to items that are usually only behind glass showcases, thus making them totally inaccessible to the blind. A flintlock pistol. A brass ring, a copy, belonging to the mother of Kolokotronis, a War of Independence military hero. The mortuary portrait of Nikitaras, another prominent warrior who died blind, with one eye even deformed by wound. We also offer a series of recordings, for example short passages from Western travelers, or, like in this case, uh, the example I'm going to uh, make you listen to, music played on the tambura of General Makriyanis. These recordings are also available through our website and YouTube channels. We also offer a recording explaining the whole touch tour together with practical instructions. The project was made possible with funding by the Stavros Nyarchos Foundation through the Cultural Heritage Without Borders Bosnia-Herzegovina and the Balkan Museum Network to which the museum is member. We made a partnership with the Lighthouse for the Blind, gaining knowledge and training for the, from them and in turn providing these copies and, and some more uh, some of the tactile exhibits uh, for their own tactile museum. We also used for our recordings the studio they have for producing audiobooks. Last, and maybe most original, we included blind tour guides who are able to guide mixed seeing and non-seeing groups of people. We offer them a work outlet and so assist not only with the social inclusion of blind visitors, but also of blind professionals, like the lady here on the left. Our staff also received a summary training as to the requirements of conduct and the needs of blind visitors. The most common mistake I also made at the beginning is when talking to a blind person addressing yourself to his escort and refer to him in third person as if he was incapable of direct communication. With these two examples, I tried to highlight the character of the National Historical Museum. Being an old and venerable institution, it has managed to open up to new inclusive perspectives. We provide a whole array of educational programs and edu exhibitions and try to reach out to broader sections of the public. We do not want to merely reproduce what everybody knows or is supposed to know. Today we want to shed new light to old subject matters and we want to help the, to, uh, the public to learn, discuss, get involved, make up their own mind. Our grand project at this moment is the bicentenary of the Greek War of Independence, due next year, 2021. This is our logo. Our goal is to avoid reproducing the traditional storytelling that we already show in our permanent display. We intend to add subject matters that are recent to scholarly research and even newer in museum presentations. Heroes are to be presented as human beings, elevated to their status not because they belong to a generation of titans, but because they rose up to extreme circumstances. Women in a masculine world. Private life, amusements, health and well-being in times of crisis. And of course, how did our ideology of emancipation lead us to our self-image of today? The museum is cooperating with another 10 regional museums plus a floating exhibition in a traditional vessel in order to co-present a grand exhibition spanning the whole Greek territory. The museum gets outside of its walls to meet its public with the assistance of a whole cohort of public and private supporters. The program has been launched and officially presented. The news for today 
is that we have won the 2020 Golden Prize for graphic design for it in Greece. Thank you all for listening. Goodbye.